Hello, everybody, and welcome to An Evening with Neil Ferguson. Historian, writer, broadcaster, and Harvard professor. Neil is actually the Lawrence A. Tisch Professor of History at Harvard, of course. But he's also now on his way to Stanford uh, as a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution. Now, whether you are from the right, whether you are from the left, or whether that is not a meaningful description of you, uh, Neil Ferguson is out to make you think. Some of you may have read uh, one or more of his 14 books, Empire, uh, Colossus, Civilization, uh, all books that bring history alive with uh, dramatic relevance. You might even have worked your way through the meticulously researched House of Rothschild, Volume 1 and Volume 2. Well, in his spare time, Neil does do documentaries with the sort of award-winning success that leaves some of us who have spent years in television quite exasperated. His passion for the counterfactual leaves some of the world's top thinkers, especially those from the left, very frustrated. He has a comment from The Guardian. Uh, quote, in more than a dozen books and countless columns, he's attempted to dismantle certain accepted notions of history, as well as the very concept of agreeing with Neil Ferguson. But above all, he is a maudlin man, educated at Oxford's most magnificent college of maudlin, and tonight is very special for me, uh, because we were actually freshmen together. Uh, we spent just a year down the corridor from each other at some uh, rather basic maudlin digs, and uh, we shared the same kettle. My enduring memory of Neil in those days was the tightly pleated college gown that he wore that reflected his uh, demi uh, scholarly status at Oxford, uh, unlike our rubbish black tea towels. Uh, and that also he was usually adorned uh, with some gorgeous creature who reminded me uh, recently of Taylor Swift. <laughs> Three decades later, he swapped Tete for the remarkable Ian Hersey Ali, and together they make an impossibly smart and thought-provoking couple. Uh, Neil has a sort of big brain to make some sense of the world, uh, the very interesting times we live in in 2016, and put it in context. Uh, he's here as a guest of the Centre for Independent Studies, and he's managed to fit in an Australian Davis on Heyman overnight. Uh, Neil will talk, uh, we'll have a chat, and then we'd like you to be asking the questions. Ladies and gentlemen, Neil Ferguson. Thank you very much indeed. It's, uh rather extraordinary to go from those distant days, I won't say exactly how distant, in Oxford, to the Sydney Opera House. Perhaps it's appropriate, because I decided to become a historian on stage. Admittedly, it was a rather more modest stage than this one. I was, I was playing the caterpillar in a, a production of Alice in Wonderland, it was a musical, uh, in the, the Dean's Garden at Christchurch College. And it was one of a series of lousy parts that I'd landed in my Oxford dramatic career. And halfway through the run, sitting on a large painted toadstool smoking a uh, hookah, I decided that I should abandon theatre and indeed abandon all the other things that I'd tried and failed to do at Oxford, and go back to the one thing I seemed to be fairly competent at, which was to write history essays. Standing here all those years later, I know it's a little hard for some people to understand, because theatre is glamorous, look at this. And being a historian, let's be absolutely frank, is not glamorous at all. It's not coincidental that the most boring teacher in the Harry Potter novels is Mr. Binns, the history teacher. So boring is Mr. Binns that he has died without realizing it and continues as a ghost <laughs> to lecture on the Goblin Wars. 
When you think about it, historians do have a slightly morbid quality, don't they? Because they, they are people who, broadly speaking, prefer to spend their time with the dead rather than with the living. And if not with the dead, then people who are really very, very old indeed. Now, why would you prefer to spend your days turning the pages of the letters and diaries of, of the dead or the really, really old? Isn't there something slightly sad about being a historian? Well, I thought what I would do tonight would be to explain why I decided to stop being a caterpillar and become, or a lovey, uh, and become a historian. And I'm going to do it with reference to a, a couple of books. First, the extraordinary autobiography of a philosopher of history almost none of you are likely to have heard of, uh, R.G. Collingwood. And Collingwood was the very model of an Oxford don. He was entirely made of tweed. <laughs> but he wrote a wonderful autobiography which set out what I discovered when I came across it was my philosophy of history. Let me quote from this wonderful book, published just on the eve of World War II. We study history in order to see more clearly into the situation in which we are called upon to act. Hence, the plane on which ultimately all problems arise is the plane of real life, that to which they are referred for their solution is history. I realized when I came across Collingwood's autobiography that he was talking my language. He was arguing for what I would call applied history, the study of the past with a view to understanding the present better. In another wonderful passage, Collingwood says that historians are like, like woodsmen who are very familiar with uh, a wooded landscape. Because they've read a lot about the past, they see things, he calls them tigers in the grass, that the unwary traveler may not see. Another exponent of applied history uh, was and is Henry Kissinger, whose biography I'm halfway through writing. The first volume was published just last year. And I, I, I wanted to begin by, by sharing the, the four things that I learned from writing that first volume. There are four insights which seem to me relevant to almost all of us and to illustrate why studying history is a way of understanding the present better. One of the first things that Kissinger pointed out to his contemporaries during the Cold War was that nearly all decisions that would have to be taken in the Cold War were between evils. And the moral challenge for the statesman was to choose the lesser or the least of evils. There were very few motherhood and apple pie type options likely to present themselves. The second thing that I, I learned from writing this book was that any, any decision that might be taken by a strategist or for that matter a businessman was essentially conjectural. It was based on a conjecture about the future. If you thought catastrophe was approaching and you acted to preempt catastrophe, the problem was that if you were successful, there was no real payoff. Because nobody's really grateful for disasters averted that therefore don't happen. Whereas it's much more tempting to kick the can down the road, as we now say, and hope that all will be well, hope that something will turn up. And, of course, sometimes you get lucky. So this problem of conjecture that Kissinger talks about, I found extremely insightful. The third thing I learned about Kissinger, and I'll probably talk about this a bit with Tiki and you in the discussion, was that far from being the arch-realist that he's often portrayed as being the Machiavellian or Bismarckian figure, actually Kissinger was an idealist who spent most of his academic career writing critiques of ruthless, uh, cynical, 
Machiavellian types. Metternich and Bismarck were not his heroes, contrary to popular belief. And in fact, Kissinger concludes uh, his unpublished biography of Bismarck, which I found in amongst his private papers, the, the unpublished book. He concludes it really by arguing that, that Bismarck's career illustrates the danger of trying to base a foreign policy, base a strategy on complete cynicism. But the fourth thing, which is most relevant tonight, is Kissinger's insight about history. Kissinger says at one point that history is to states what character is to individual human beings. And you can't understand your counterparty in any negotiation if you don't understand the history of, of his or, or her country. This is a simple uh, insight. You might even think it obvious. But it's become clear to me that the overwhelming majority, certainly of American statesmen, have not approached the world in that spirit. Imagine trying to deal with the Russian president not knowing any Russian history. Imagine a meeting with the Chinese president without any real background knowledge of Chinese history. So history is, for me, a way of understanding and trying to solve contemporary problems. I've never studied it for its own sake, as I think I was told at Oxford I should. I've always been much closer to Collingwood and, and Kissinger in thinking about it. So then I decided tonight to do something very ambitious. I thought I'd try and summarize all that I have written about over 25 years in five minutes. <laughs> now, I want to make it clear that this is not to excuse you from buying <laughs> all 14 books, but it, it doesn't really matter if you don't read them, because you'll know what they say when I'm done. <laughs> so, the first point, I think, is that I believe that the spread of what we used to call Western civilization the spread of ideas and institutions from Northwestern Europe to most of the rest of the world after around 1500 or maybe 1600 was, on balance, a good thing. Not an unmitigated good thing. It had many, many costs. But the benefits, in my belief, outweighed those costs. Now, the extraordinary divergence that happened from around 1600 to about the 1970s between the West and the rest is one of the most staggering facts of economic history. And explaining it is one of the great challenges that a modern historian has to grapple with. In this weekend's Wall Street Journal, my old friend Deirdre McCluskey has a go at explaining it. She and I agree on many things but differ, I think, on one point. In my view, the success of the West had nothing whatsoever to do with the things that people thought it had to do with 100 years ago. 100 years ago, uh, it was very common to explain Western success in terms of race, but that was all nonsense. And it was nonsense, too, to try and explain it in terms of religion or, or culture. That doesn't work either. Nor, with all due respect to Jared Diamond and others, can we really explain it in terms of geography. Otherwise, why did it happen after 1600 and not after 600? The geography didn't change. So the argument that I've made in a lot of my recent work, such as the book Civilization, is that the great divergence has to do with ideas and institutions. Not just ideas, which is really what Deirdre McCluskey argues, but institutions too. And they, the two need one another. The idea of, of competition is something legitimate. The idea of the scientific revolution and the institutions that made it possible. The idea of the rule of law based on private property and the law courts and non-corrupt judges that made that possible. 
the idea of a scientific approach to, to medicine and healthcare and the institutions like my father's profession, the doctors who made that possible. The idea of a consumer society, the idea that you should all have multiple cotton garments, and I know you all do. I don't need to look in your wardrobes to know that you have too many clothes, actually, and you just keep buying more, don't you? And that's really important because without that infinitely elastic appetite for, for clothing, there would be no point in having an industrial revolution. And finally, the idea of work itself, the work ethic, which, which Max Weber wrongly thought had something to do with Protestantism. Uh, well, he hadn't met my students at Tsinghua, who have a work ethic that would make almost any Protestant I know weak at the knees. So these were what I called the six killer apps of Western civilization. And the whole point about it was to say that anybody could download these. They were open access software. They were not specific to white males. Anybody could benefit from these ideas and institutions. And most of the world's history uh, in the modern period has been uh, shaped by the downloading of the killer apps by the Chinese, by the Indians, by a whole range of different societies that previously lacked these six extraordinary advantageous ideas and institutions. So the British Empire was not itself a killer app. It was certainly a killer in some respects, but it wasn't an app in the way I'm using the term because empire was the least original thing that people from Northwestern Europe did. It was, it was what everybody did. Most of history is the history of empire. Get over it. And you can't explain the great divergence in terms of empire since everybody did imperialism. What do you think the Aztecs were doing? What were the Ming doing? So it can't really be about empire. But what is true is that by creating in the course of the 17th, 18th, and 19th century, the largest empire ever, what the British created unintentionally was a transmission mechanism for their ideas and institutions. And in some places, they forcibly imposed those ideas and institutions, and in other places, they didn't really have to. They just spread there because the empire let it happen. By the middle of the 19th century, certainly in the second half of it, the British Empire was an enormous engine of globalization, promoting not only free trade, but the free mobility of labor and capital on a scale that had never been seen before. And this country is, to a very large extent, a product of that process. In a book called Empire, I tried to explain the costs and the benefits of British imperialism. It was published in 2002, 2003, I think, and it was at that point, of course, that the United States was embarking on an imperial project of its own. What was it about Afghanistan and Mesopotamia that seemed so familiar? Uh, well, of course, these were exactly the places that other empires had gone, not only the British, but many before and after them. In Colossus, I argued that the problem with the American project of empire was that it was unlikely to be as successful as the British because of three deficits. The first was a fundamental manpower deficit. Americans, unlike Scotsmen, do not like going to far away, hot, poor, dangerous countries. Whereas to us, it just seems like an improvement in the weather. <laughs> Americans do not have this appetite. They've already arrived somewhere where they want to be, and the notion of spending more than six months in somewhere like Iraq is really an unpleasant one to them. So it was a fundamental manpower deficit. Americans don't want to live in Iraq. They just don't. Then there was a fiscal deficit. It was already obvious in 2004 that the United States was going to spend much more on wars in Iraq and Afghanistan than anybody realized, and it already was in an unsustainable fiscal position. The third deficit, though, was the most important one. I was the guy who spotted that the US empire suffered from attention deficit disorder syndrome. It had an attention deficit, meaning that after around about at most four years, most people in the electorate would have lost interest in the project of trying to create some kind of stable 
democratic state in a place like Iraq. So this was really where my thinking was in the mid-Bush years. And it was thinking about the fiscal deficit that led me to start thinking about the financial institutions more broadly that shaped the world. Because there's a special subset of Western institutions that got globalized uh, in, the, in the age of empire. Institutions like banks, institutions like bond markets, stock markets, mortgage markets, insurance products. In the ascent of money, I tried to show that one of the distinctive features of Western globalization was the spread of a system of financial institutions that was really quite unique. And this had been globalized by the mid-2000s to an unprecedented extent. And then I realized, this was in 2006, oh God, the whole thing is completely unstable and is going to blow up. And it's going to blow up because of something completely absurd. Subprime mortgages in places like Memphis, Tennessee. You have to picture the scene. I'm in Channel 4's headquarters in London, shiny office, self-confident, commissioning editor. I'm trying to sell the idea of a television series about the coming financial crisis. And it's a rather sneering response. Neil. You know, I just don't see why British viewers would be remotely interested in subprime mortgages. I said, trust me, trust me, this is going to matter a lot. And sure enough, by the time The Ascent of Money was finished and the book was being published, the crisis had begun, which meant that I had to change all the tenses in the introduction and the conclusion. It's very inconvenient to do if you've ever had to change the tenses from the future to the present. Economic shocks on the scale of 2008 happen really quite rarely. There really have only been three depression-like events in the modern era. Everybody knows 1929, but there was also one in 1873. And I've been thinking a lot about that crisis as well as the crisis of the, 19, the 1930s. The reason I think a lot about this is that after any major financial crisis, history tells us there's trouble. There's usually an enormous macroeconomic shock and unemployment and people lose money and for several years all anybody thinks about is how to cope. But then after a while, as things begin to improve, they turn to politics and they are looking for payback. Economic volatility of the sort that we have seen in what Australians call the JFC, Nobody else calls it that. <laughs> if you say that in New York, they don't know what you're talking about. So events like that in the 1930s had cataclysmic consequences. And in a book called War of the World, I argued that it was the economic volatility colliding with multi-ethnic societies in conditions of imperial decline that made Central and Eastern Europe the most explosive part of the world ever in the 1940s. The bloodiest, most destructive violence in human history happened there and then partly because of the economic shock that the Depression administered. So obviously we need to understand and think carefully about whether or not the consequences of our financial and economic shock could be comparable. If war of the world implied anything, it implied that we should be concerned about the economic and political consequences of a major financial crisis. I'm going to speak for just 15 minutes more, and what I want to do in that time is apply history. I'm going to apply what I've learned over 25, 35 years of studying the subject to our present situation. First, I'm going to tell you a formula. It's not really a formula, it's a kind of recipe, because history is not a science, let's be clear. 
It's, it's more like a cookbook. But the formula or the recipe is for populism. And I'd like you to follow me. I, I gather uh, Nigella Lawson spoke here recently, uh, and also Jamie Oliver. So this is the moment for the historian to do the celebrity chef routine. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a little, little pinch of rising immigration, just add that into the pot, and then we're going to add some widening inequality, and then we're going to get some public perception of corruption, and then we're going to add a big financial crisis, turn the heat up on this, turn it up, get it boiling nicely, and then we'll finish the dish off by adding the demagogue. This is the recipe for populism always. That's how it works. And all over the world right now, we are seeing demagogues pop up in precisely the kind of boiling sauce that I've just concocted. And the one that everybody wants to talk about is Donald Trump. I was a bit embarrassed to talk about him since he was, of course, is, of course, the son of a Scottish woman. And while I like to lay claim to most of the world's great inventions, whiskey, I'm not so keen on golf, but golf, uh, economic liberalism, Donald Trump, I'm afraid, is at least partly our fault. <laughs> now, you, like me, are succumbing to the temptation not to take Trump seriously. Arianna Huffington, famously, when Trump announced his intention to run for president, said she would cover the Trump campaign in the entertainment section of the Huffington Post. Well, I think a lot of people who are paid a lot of money for writing about US politics should be seeking gainful employment in some other field, maybe fast food, uh, because they were all spectacularly, epically wrong. And they're still being wrong. It's still very hard to get people to realize just how likely it is that Donald Trump becomes the next president of the United States. Let me tell you how likely it is. The betting prediction markets give him a 28% probability right now. Sort of one in four type chance. But three national polls appeared on Thursday comparing Trump and Clinton in a general election. And Trump was ahead by three points in one and by five points in another and only behind in the third of the polls. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a 50-50 chance, there's a one in two probability that he will be the next president of the United States. And so it really, really matters to ask the question, is this the 1930s all over again? As some good friends of mine sincerely believe, or is this something else? Is that the wrong analogy? The 1930s get overused as an analogy, because I sometimes think it's the only history some people know. And if you only know about the 1930s, then everybody looks like Hitler, at least if you, you know, <laughs> blur your eyes a bit. I think it's the wrong analogy, and here's why. The economic shock of the 1930s was much worse than ours has been. The unemployment rates were three times as high as the peak unemployment rates in the major economies. And what we're seeing today is populism, not fascism. What's the difference? Only a historian can tell you. You just don't bother asking the political scientists. They'll come back with a regression analysis that will be entirely worthless. Fascism is about uniforms, violence, and war. Populism is different. Populism is about restricting immigration, putting on tariffs to limit free trade, attacking banks and limiting free capital movement. It's distinctive in its tone and it's distinctive in its policies. And this is populism, not fascism. It's actually doing a violence to what happened in the 1930s to confuse these two things. I like to single out uh, to illustrate the point, the case of Dennis Kearney. Put your hand up if you've heard of Dennis Kearney. Good for you, sir. <laughs> you thought of applying to Harvard? 
Dennis Kearney was the Trump of the 1870s. Dennis Kearney led a movement, Californian-based movement, to restrict Chinese immigration. His slogan was, kick the Chinese out. He was very like Trump in a lot of respects, including the fact that he himself was immigrant in origin. He was an Irishman. And the Kearneyist movement has much more in common with what we're seeing in America today than anything that happened anywhere in the 1930s. The reason I tell you this is that the style of populism should not lead us to underestimate it. Because Kearney achieved a very substantial part of what he set out to achieve before he vanished into oblivion. In particular, he achieved the 1882 Exclusion Act, the first of a succession of legislative measures that excluded the Chinese from the United States, ended Chinese immigration uh, to the United States. Populism is consequential. Those who say, oh, what he says on the campaign trail is one thing, what he'll do in office is another, are succumbing to a delusion. Populists have to deliver to their fickle followers or they're gone. That is why the, the wall along the Mexican border, the ban on Muslim immigration, all of these policy ideas are not simply throwaway lines, they are the essence of a true populist project. So, two further questions, and then I'm going to wrap up and go into a discussion with you all. Does populism lead to conflict? You see, if you draw a slightly straight line from the 1870s and 1880s, when populist movements like Kearney's sprang up all over the world, they existed in Europe as well. If you draw a line to 1914, you might be tempted for think to think populism leads to conflict, oh dear. But actually, that would be wrong. Because the road to World War I led through progressivism, not populism. A lot had happened in Europe and in the United States by 1914. And the decision makers of 1914 were actually not populists. The populists had really vanished from the scene by then. In Britain, Lloyd George had just passed his people's budget. He was a progressive if ever there was one. Uh, in the German Reich, the biggest party in the Reichstag was the Social Democratic Party. And in the United States, an earnest Princeton constitutional lawyer, Woodrow Wilson, was the man who would ultimately lead the United States to war. The fact of the matter is that it hasn't been populists who've tended to lead anybody to war, because populists don't really lead like going abroad for any purpose at all. <laughs> Their dominant mode is isolationism, not, not war. It's amazing that Trump has revived the slogan, America first, to me, that was just a massively staggering moment of cognitive dissonance, revealing just how historically ignorant many people are, because surely that whole concept was discredited by its use as a slogan by isolationists in the 1930s, isolationists, some of whom were indeed fascist sympathizers. So America first doesn't imply conflict. At least, I, I don't think it does. And now we come to the challenge, the really hard bit, of doing applied history. And that is to do historical analysis in real time. We all have to make a judgment, at least those of us based in the United States, have to make a judgment about what exactly the Trump presidency would imply if he has that 50-50 chance of winning it if he's just a coin toss away from the White House. The only way of doing that, I think, is to analyze a document. Now, Donald Trump's foreign policy uh, has been articulated, if articulated is the word, <laughs> in a variety of speeches, interviews, and in one particular speech in New York a few weeks ago that was designed to be the flagship speech on foreign policy. With the finely honed skills of an Oxford-trained medievalist, I am now going to try to understand this document on your behalf. <laughs> it matters. I think it means 
America first, based on national interests, no more free trade, a revival of Cold War bipartisanship. Two, increase military spending, reduce the debt, somehow or other, revive manufacturing. Three, press America's allies in Europe and Asia to contribute more. Four, do a, quote, great deal with Russia. I must say that great deal has me very worried already. What exactly is Trump going to do a deal with Putin about? So real estate seems like the obvious thing. <laughs> there goes Eastern Ukraine. Can you see Trump Towers Damascus? I think that's where he's going. Build the wall and make Mexico pay. So a kind of stimulus program for the Mexican economy. <laughs> and here's where it gets really interesting. China, second largest economy in the world, the rising power, a place that you in Australia need to watch very closely indeed. Trump proposes to impose across the board tariffs on the Chinese economy, to force the Chinese government to rein in North Korea, and to end its island building or enlarging program in the South China Sea. So that's interesting because I think it implies a much more confrontational stance towards Beijing than anybody in Beijing currently expects. And I've just spent two weeks there, and the standard Chinese response to Trump is this. Oh, American politicians always bash China on the campaign trail, and then when they get into the White House, it's fine. And he's a businessman, so we can do a great deal with him. This is a mistake. This is a mistake. To imagine that Trump is not going to deliver on these pledges is a fundamental error. It comes of misunderstanding populism. Dennis Kearney didn't just say, I was just kidding about stopping the Chinese coming to California. He went after exclusion until it was legislated. Never underestimate the commitment of the populists to their program. The final and perhaps most puzzling, potentially inflammatory part of Trump's foreign policy is that he intends to treat radical Islam as the primary enemy, to end or scrap the Iran deal, to have what he now calls a pause for reassessment of Muslim immigration, and in some unexplained way to destroy Islamic State. ISIS's days are numbered. Trump won't say why or how, because, quote, we have to be unpredictable. <laughs> so what I did there was essentially I tried to be a historian thinking of Trump's foreign policy as if it's 20 years down the line or 30 years down the line, I'm sitting there trying to figure out how did we get into that incredible mess in 2017? Why was it that everybody underestimated the man's chance of becoming the Republican nominee, then they underestimated his chance of becoming the president, and then they underestimated the likelihood that he would actually do the stuff he said he was going to do? And what will the consequences be if something like this happens? We only have history to guide us. And we can't be sure. This is the intellectual challenge that makes applied history so rewarding, ultimately. It isn't easy. What is ISIS anyway? A rag taggle of fanatics who could be taken out by special forces in a matter of weeks? I've heard that said. Or are they where the Bolsheviks were exactly 100 years ago? on the brink of becoming an authentic state with vast resources, posing a mortal threat to our freedoms and actually gaining sustenance from Donald Trump's crass rhetoric. As I mentioned earlier, history is not a science. Perhaps it is closer to cooking than it is to physics. But it seems to me that applied history is something that we need to do more of, that our leaders need to study more, 
I'd love to see applied history central to the curriculum of all the major universities in the Western world. And I'd like to see historians and history departments studying these issues rather than, I don't know, sex, class, and identity in antebellum South Carolina circa 1853 which doesn't seem to me to be the way ahead for our subject. Let me conclude with a quote from Kissinger. History is not, Kissinger said in 1967, a cookbook offering pre-tested recipes. It teaches by analogy, not by maxims. It can illuminate the consequences of actions in comparable situations Yet each generation must discover for itself what situations are, in fact, comparable. Ladies and gentlemen, that is why I study history and why I chose not to spend my career sitting on painted toadstools on stages less grand than this. And I hope tonight, at least in some measure, I've convinced you that we need to apply history much, much more. Thank you very much. There we go. That's right. That's brilliant. Otherwise, we'll get every other word. Neil, that was a tour de force. Thank you very much. Can I start with Kissinger? You've already done something like this in terms of the the most impossible task ahead of you: two volumes of the House of Rothschild. How did you come to decide to do Kissinger, Volumes 1 and 2? To be honest, Iggy, I tried to avoid it. Having done one vast archivally-based project in the Rothschild history, and then a modest biography that was still very document-heavy, a biography of Sigmund Warburg, I was very hesitant indeed about writing Kissinger's life. And when he suggested it to me, I said no. I should explain by way of background how this came about. I first met him years and years ago in London, and we had a very interesting conversation about a book I'd written on the First World War, The Pity of War. And then something extraordinary happened, which has always remained with me. In mid-sentence, Kissinger vanished and reappeared on the other side of the room, at least 25 feet away, beside the supermodel L. McPherson, who had just walked in. <laughs> and I remember thinking, I could learn something from this man. <laughs> so we had a correspondence and a conversation, and, and out of it came the idea that he might uh, commission me to write his, his biography. And I, I wasn't the first person he asked. You're not. I may even have been the third. Uh, and I said no, because I thought, A, it's just going to be a massive amount of work, huge piles of, of material, and then, then, this is more than 10 years ago now, and then Christopher Hitchens will write this really searing review of the book, so... Indeed. Well, sadly, that's not going to happen now. It's very sad. I, I was very fond of, of Hitch, and I, I probably would have hated his review, although a little part of me imagines that perhaps just to spite his left-wing friends, he might have given it a good review. At any event, <laughs> I said no, and Kissinger wrote back this very Kissingerian letter, which went like this. How, I wouldn't do the voice. How very disappointing. Just as I had made up my mind that you were the perfect man to write the book, and just as I found 154 boxes of private papers that I had thought had been lost. I don't know if any of you engage in fishing as a pursuit, but the fly landed on the surface of the water and the fish Ferguson swam towards it and bit. So I went and, and a couple of days later, uh, a couple of weeks later, I was sitting going through these, these boxes and the material was just so extraordinary that I realized I had to, I realized almost And, and you talked to him, presumably you talked to him often? Yes, well I, I interviewed him early on, not realizing that uh, Henry Kissinger is going to live to be 150. So you'll be there for volume two? <laughs> almost certainly. I expect him to give the memorial address at my funeral. <laughs> Neil, 
a little contrarian, unlike you, uh, Kissinger the idealist. Yeah, some people think that subtitle was just designed to infuriate readers of the New York Times, and maybe the Sydney Morning Herald, but, uh, <laughs> which it was, I have to admit. <laughs> but it was based on an insight that hit me almost as soon as I began reading these, these early, many unpublished essays and letters and diaries. He wasn't the realist that I had expected. I had actually imagined subtitling the book American Machiavelli. That was my original book proposal subtitle. Mm. And within a very short period of time of reading the stuff, I realized this is all wrong. The young Kissinger, and this first volume is the first half of his life, the young Kissinger was none, none of the things that I had been led to expect. He was not influenced by Machiavelli, never referred to him. So this is perfect territory for Neil Ferguson, really. Well, it was, I don't know, I suppose I'm attracted to writing history because I always find out very quickly once I get to the documents that everything that's been written before is wrong. Yeah. And that's very exciting and it's sort of, in, it, it's, it's uplifting in a way because then you realize, ah, oh, there is a point to writing this book. I really have something new to say. And, and in at least three respects, Kissinger turns out to have been an idealist. Uh, he was an idealist because he thought appeasement was a realist policy that had gone disastrously wrong. He was an idealist because he immensed himself in the philosophy of Immanuel Kant while he was at Harvard. And he was an idealist because he repeatedly defined the Cold War as a battle of ideas, a battle between the idea of freedom and unfreedom defined by the Soviet system. He was not one of those people who thought it was a struggle between economic systems. In fact, he was clearly an anti-materialist in his philosophy. So, no, it's not just a provocation. I think it's absolutely clear that people have got him wrong. He's highly critical of Metternich, he's highly critical of Bismarck, okay. and I see the early Kissinger as truly an idealist. All right. Well, we'll look forward to volume one and then volume two a little later. Let me get back to populism. I loved your recipe, by the way. Um, how did the United States end up with two of the most um, disliked candidates in history. I think that's what Huffington said, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, I think because the political establishments in both parties completely underestimated the populist backlash. They didn't realize that there would need to be something much, much more compelling in the wake of the financial crisis than Jeb Bush, uh, or for that matter, Hillary Clinton, uh, was offering. And so I think it was mainly a failure of elites. And elites failed to get it because they are so disconnected from ordinary Americans. This was a point my good friend Charles Murray made uh, several years ago in his brilliant book, Coming Apart. Uh, American societies come apart so much that people who sit at Harvard or sit in Washington think tanks or who are running the major parties uh, in Congress have almost no contact with the regular Joe Sixpack guy who is the core Trump voter. So they didn't hear it. They weren't in the bar. They weren't having the conversation. And, I, you know, I, I have a curious... Um, advantage over these professional commentators. Because of my wife's courage, her work on the problem of Islamic extremism, uh, she and therefore I also uh, require security, we require protection. And it turned out that the guys providing our security were a better guide to the US election than any of the professional commentators on CNN. Way better. And they got early on the significance of Trump. He tells it like it is. I remember that phrase from early on. Yeah. He's going to shake things up. That's really what it's all about. I think the policy detail, you know, the, the immigration changes, even the wall, I think that's much less important to so, the guys who support him than the broad idea that he's not this damned corrupt political establishment that was to blame for the crisis. So the last 24, 48 hours, he's come out uh, probably predictably uh, with the NRA um, on guns, uh, actually suggesting that uh, the Clinton administration would, uh, would get rid of the right to bear arms. Now, surprisingly, perhaps, Hillary Clinton has come back at him. Now, normally, for populist reasons, the Democrats would run away from trying to position themselves. I'm just wondering whether this is something new. The gun issue is a bit eccentric because it's one of the odd things that Sanders is actually not left-wing about. Maybe the only thing he's not left-wing about. So it, it's an opportunity for her to try to rally her 
her left-wing support, which is essentially fading away. If it weren't for the superdelegates, Sanders would get the nomination. The superdelegates are the only thing that's keeping Hillary Clinton in this game. Uh, and, and because the Democratic Party is more rigged than the Republican Party, the populist can't actually get the nomination. But when you think about it, that's why Trump was such a good shot at this. The latest polls show that Sanders would beat Trump. But they, they suggest clearly that he has a very much better chance against Hillary because the, the mood is so hostile to the establishment. Uh, and I think that's really the key to understanding this election. Let's go to promises and breaking promises because that's something that resonates here in Australia. Now, uh, your fellow Dennis Kearney uh, in 1870s California, a great orator, I understand. Now, he, he actually said, apparently, that to shoot, encourage the crowd, to shoot the first man that goes back on you after you have elected him intelligently. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, Bake, the breaking of promises and back backflips, there's a video going viral at the moment of 13 minutes of Hillary Clinton lying. Now, how significant, <laughs> how significant and how, or how damaging is that, the whole idea of breaking promises? Well, I think it's the key to why we shouldn't underestimate Trump's readiness to do some of this stuff. People close to him have said publicly, he will execute. He himself has said that within the first 100 days, the design for the wall will be done. He'll have all the CEOs into the White House, into the Oval Office, to tell them that if they, uh, if they outsource jobs, they'll be fined. I mean, I think there will be action. The great mistake is to imagine that he's a sort of American Berlusconi who's going to win power and then just throw bunga bunga parties. Uh-uh-uh. Uh-uh-uh. This is not Italy. And this is not Berlusconi. And, and you know, Trump, I think, in that, in that sense, is going to act. And, and that's why the populism analogy is good. I, I was teaching for two weeks in Beijing, and I taught the case, the example of Kearney and the, uh, and the Exclusion Act of 1882, and I could see these young Chinese students were absolutely stunned to, to, to realize that a populist had, with relatively, really relative ease, had got the US Congress to pass uh, this extraordinary blanket ban on Chinese immigration. So let's not pretend there couldn't be a blanket ban on Muslim immigration. There, there could. It's one of the most popular things that Trump has proposed. You're warning strongly that Trump will actually deliver on what he promises, yeah. and in a way that this will be very bad. This is a, yes, yes. that it will be very disruptive, and we can't really, with any confidence or any certainty, dismiss, in the way that I hear uh, him being dismissed, dismiss Trump as somebody who's in the campaign trail making all these noises, but when he's in power will be just a Is it not possible he might be more of a chameleon than that? That he actually might be able to get into power and then convince the electorate that actually, no, if the, you know, a pullback of free trade is not actually the way to go, that he will be able to manage them, um, perhaps like he can do between now and November on women. I think the, the lesson of, of the Trump experience is clearly that he can believe five contradictory things a day yeah. and nobody minds, and this is part of the reality TV, Twitter age that we, we live in. Uh, but I think that his supporters are not stupid people, and they are alert and will be alert to any abandonment of the core anti-globalization essence of the Trump movement. It is an anti Migration, free migration, anti-free trade, anti-free capital party. And if, if, if Trump doesn't deliver on those things, he will be a one-term president. And I always ask my students, what do you think the first question someone asks themselves is on the morning after they're elected president of the United States? And the answer to that question is, how do I get re-elected for a second term? Every single president asks that question, and he will be no different. So where does this leave the elites? Where does this leave the Republican Party? Um, and indeed, if we look at our own Prime Minister here, the expectations that he would drive a reform agenda, that is not happening. What is it going to take for leaders to get up and lead? Well, I was attending, along with your husband, uh, the Australian leadership retreat uh, in uh, Hayman Island, just before I came here. And uh, I was very mis mystified by the invitation that I received because I misread it. And at first I thought I was being invited to the Australian leadership. Retreat! 
I thought that was the essence of Malcolm Turnbull's campaign. <laughs> so, the problem is, to be serious, uh, that, that leadership has been wholly absent uh, in the United States and in many European countries. Political establishments have essentially led by subtle moves in response to polling. There hasn't really been any uh, of the kind of leadership we saw in the 1980s uh, when leaders, Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, made decisive and difficult choices that ended up having enormously beneficial consequences for their countries and I think also for the world. Today's elites, whether they're on the left or the right, whether they're social democrats or uh, conservatives or liberals, uh, in, in Australian terms, need to get to work redefining their agendas and offering the kind of leadership that has been conspicuous by its absence. People have a right to better answers to this very simple question. Why are things worse than they were, say, 16 years ago? Uh, for, for most Americans, I know for most Australians they're not worse, but for most Americans, they are. The median household is significantly and worse Neil, off. And Neil, the issue of inequality, it is such an important issue. That great TED talk in 2014, the pitchforks are coming. Um, that doesn't seem to have been addressed. The nexus between the political elites and the banks, we've got the you know, Royal Commission of, um, into banking, uh, a very, very strong idea that's being pushed by the opposition at the moment. It's a very popular idea. Um, how do, do leaders get over or solve for inequality? Well, let, let, me, let me answer briefly, and then before the pitchforks come out, we should probably take some questions from the, uh, the, the floor in a spirit of, of democracy. I think the, 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 the key to redefining the politics of our time, in fact, lies with the intellectuals. In the 1970s, there was a great rethink on the right a fundamental rethink that Greg Lindsay, who's here tonight, uh, was a part of in setting up the Center for Independent Studies. A reassessment of the market, re-reading of Hayek, a fundamental revitalization of, of what became in the UK conservative politics in the Thatcher era, but it had its, it had its, uh, its versions all over the Western world. Uh, and so it began, in fact, with the intellectuals. Nothing comparable has happened, at least in the US, uh, in the last 10 years, with the result that the establishment candidates went out on the campaign trail with very, very lame, uh, dusted down versions of earlier policy platforms. Tax cuts. In an age when inequality is the issue, and tax cuts have happened, tax cuts cease to be a salient proposition. They only lead to, in the case of the United States, non-credible fiscal uh, programs. So I think there needs to be a big rethink. Institutions like CIS will undoubtedly be a, a part of it, but until that happens, establishment politicians will essentially be without the kind of dynamic ideas they need to have to counter the populists. Donald Trump filled a vacuum. There were no credible answers to the question, why did we get screwed over the last 16 years? And he provided them. His answers, I think, are wrong. I don't think you can blame it on immigration. I don't think you can blame it on free trade. I think both those things were, in fact, very good for the United States. But I think you probably can blame at least some of the problem on a corrupt political elite. And precisely that energy that's being directed against uh, a discredited elite is what could very well put him in the White House. All right. We would like um, as many people as possible uh, to be able to ask questions. Now, you'll see microphones numbered. There's two, four at the back, three, and one. If any of you have a question, would like to make your way towards them, I'll, um, I'll just have one more, if I may, while we're waiting for this. Um, because you've called it, and I think here, Neil, for the first time, uh, on um, inflation, on deflation, sorry, you've said future historians will look back on the first quarter of 2016 as the turning point, the end of the hangover. Boy, that's a big call. Well, if everybody believes in secular stagnation, which is now more or less where we are, then it's time for the contrarian, which is what I probably am by nature, to push back. 
Uh, and financial history leads us to expect the hangover to end at some point. I think it's ending around about now. I think that's already obvious in at least some indicators. I think the monetary policy is, is ultimately having the effects, albeit after long lags, that it was intended to have, at least in the United States. And I think the idea that the world is going to flatline for the a foreseeable future, which is the central idea of Larry Summers' secular yes. stagnation, is not very historically plausible. So yeah, it's a big call. I may turn out to be wrong. If you turn out to be wrong, one thing I've learned is don't dig in. <laughs> Just don't dig in. The data will come in over the next few weeks and months, and we'll see whether there was an inflection point or whether Larry's right and we're in secular stagnation. But trying to call right. these things in real time is part of what applied history should be. We should be looking to challenge anything that becomes conventional wisdom. That's what I was doing. Terrific. All right. Mike, number two, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, Neil, you made a case that the, uh, that the world should think more about history. And at the same time, you talk about popularism and there's clearly fundamental changes between history of the elites, which really was the case until people were enfranchised, and the, the era of the 140-character thought bubble. If you add to that the democratisation of economics, with the middle class saving for its own retirement for the first time in the world's history, do we run the risk of relying on the crutch of what's gone before in order to solve the problems that are coming to the future? Well, let me, uh, I'm going to give really short answers to try to get to as many people as possible in 12 minutes uh, that remain on the clock. I think the central problem is, in fact, an old one. It's a problem Edmund Burke identified when he said that the real social contract is between the generations, between the dead, the living, and the unborn. And nearly every country, including this one, is guilty at this point of a transfer of resources from future generations to the current generation. And in particular, it's already going on from young people uh, to the people who are retired. And that, that imbalance, that generational inequity, is unsustainable, unjustifiable, and will ultimately produce a backlash, a reaction by young people against what seems like a system stacked against them. So one of the central projects in my mind for a new politics in the 21st century addresses the problem of generational inequity and starts focusing people's minds on posterity instead of now, instead of me. What about the grandchildren? What is our future over the long run? That is something that in modern democracy has sadly vanished. Number four. This is a similar question. So with the rise of globalization, the increasing uh, free movement of people, uh, and uh, of course the rise of China, and then with the, uh, the breakdown of the, uh, the intergenerational social contract and also national level social contract, what do you see as being the future of the Western welfare state? It needs radical reform. And it, it will vary from country to country but that reform must be based on creating generational balance. We can't possibly create a system and sustain a system which is this skewed against future generations. Uh, it can't be right that we should live off the future, that we should live off the unborn, just because the unborn don't get to vote. So my appeal, and I'll simply reiterate this, to our politicians is, could you please include those who are disenfranchised by their youth or the fact that they haven't been born in your calculations. Let's make policies for the long run. And that must imply some fundamental reform. Otherwise, it's one, or, one of two things. This is a point Larry Kotlikoff made, my friend at Boston University years ago. Either we are going to saddle future generations with far, far higher tax bills than we paid in our time, or they are simply not going to receive a fraction of the benefits that we received in our time. And it may be some combination of the two, but that's the way it's currently set up in nearly every democracy. And it's odd because previous generations did not make arguments that excluded posterity. My grandfathers thought when they went to fight in the world wars of me. They thought of me even though I didn't exist because they risked their lives fighting for freedom always with an eye on future generations. And for some inexplicable reason, the baby boomers deleted posterity from the speeches. And we need to change that. <laughs>
Okay. Number three, sir. Uh, Niall, good evening. My name's Cameron. You couched your argument uh, about how we should be aware of Donald Trump, some of which I wouldn't agree with, but um, how do you suggest history might lead us to remove this blanket of political correctness which is smothering us? A good question. Anybody who works uh, in an American university uh, lives under that blanket uh, on a daily basis. The, uh, the safe spaces, the trigger warnings, the dread moment when you'll be called on to check your privilege. And it's a slightly bizarre uh, culture. It's like a sort of parody of the Chinese Cultural Revolution in, in which a relatively small number of militant students create an atmosphere in which free discussion becomes harder and harder. And the, the negative consequence of this is not just it seems to me inside universities. Broadly speaking, it creates an appetite for plain speaking on behalf of ordinary people, plain to the point of, of vulgar and brash. So Trump is in some measure a reaction against the PC constraints. What was to many people deeply exhilarating about Trump's speeches was their completely unfiltered quality that every single thing that was politically incorrect was there. Uh, and, and I don't think it would have been as appealing, it would not have been as exciting if these had not become taboos. Now, I can't condone the xenophobia, the misogyny, it's all in there and it's, it's malignant. But the reason that it's popular, the reason that it resonates, is that we've created an almost stifling culture uh, of, of self-censorship uh, in our academies, in our universities, in the media, and I, I think ultimately it will destroy itself. The, this will destroy itself as a culture. The, the, the absurdity of much of the research that is done in the humanities is simply self-destructive. These departments of postmodernist mumbo-jumbo will be gone in 20 years' time. They simply will not be able to sustain themselves because nobody wants to study this stuff and the class sizes just keep shrinking. So I would be of good cheer. What you're witnessing right now is this sort of dialectic in action. You know, it's this almost Hegelian. There's political correctness, the thesis, there's Trump the antithesis, and presumably some grim synthesis will emerge over the coming years. Yeah. <laughs> Number one. Neil, I don't think there'd be many people these days who would not agree that the United States and George W's actions in Iraq were a mistake in the way in which they were carried out. I'm wondering, after 40 years now, since the end of the Vietnam War, what Henry Kissinger's view is of the American involvement in Vietnam. Well, that I've already covered in volume one at some length. I'll say briefly that I think the two wars were very different. And of course, Vietnam killed many more people uh, than the Iraq war and was quite different in its character because it was embarked on by democratic administrations in the belief that there were dominoes that would fall right across Asia if North Vietnam overran South Vietnam. Uh, Iraq was different, it was a war of choice, uh, which I think with the benefit of hindsight, most people would admit it was uh, a mistake, or at least was carried out so ineptly that it would have been better if it had not been done. One of the things I show in, in the volume one of the Kissinger biography is that Kissinger was a critic of the Vietnam War much earlier than most people have realized. In 1965, he went to Vietnam for the first time. He was in no way an Asia expert. He'd already had deep doubts in 63 at the time of the coup against the Diem government in Saigon. On his trip in Vietnam, which he writes up in an amazing diary, which was one of the reasons I decided to do the book, it's just a great document, he identifies very accurately all that is going wrong with the American effort in South Vietnam and with the South Vietnamese government, and comes back at the end of that trip essentially convinced that the US will have to get out of Vietnam by diplomatic means. And for the next 10 years, a very large and rising proportion of his time was spent on trying to achieve that. So I have the second volume still to write and the obviously uh, crucial chapters still to write about Vietnam and, and about Cambodia. 
But, uh, but yeah, I think I've already begun to make an important contribution on that, on that issue. Good. Back to number two. Um, <clears throat> hi there. Um, you've talked about uh, the opportunity of using history and historians to better inform uh, decision making. Um, if that were the case, are you in favour of a, a more evidence-based approach to assessing our experts? Because there's always the danger that we spend a lot of time listening to eloquent people who are wrong a lot of the time, and people who are not so eloquent or not so precise but are generally correct are ignored. So is this an intellectualising entertainment game or not? I think it's very uh, good that you asked the question. I mean, Philip Tetlock has been writing a lot about the, the problem of bogus uh, expertise. Uh, and there's no doubt that in the realm of, of public intellectuals, there's shockingly little accountability. And I can think of at least one eminent New York Times columnist who constantly claims to be right about everything, uh, claims that it's very easy to disprove by simply reading back uh, through the years. I, I hope, hold myself to a higher standard than that. I have, uh, I have established a practice of assessing every uh, prediction that I make and trying, you're desperate to interject, could I finish? Um, and what I've learned is that one needs to be extremely rigorous about identifying what one got wrong. Uh, if one's made a predictive statement at the end of the year, look back, see how it, how it looks. Uh, so I've become much more formal in the way that I assess my own performance when I'm commenting on current events. But don't let's hold stat people to impossible standards, as is often the case. In the world of Twitter, a single error, even a tiny error, is somehow held up as evidence that you have bad faith and should be in every way discredited. Let me tell you, nobody is 100% right, and nobody can have 100% confidence in what they predict. The reality is that it is impossible to predict the future of human history. It is a process too complex to model, and most of what people say in settings like this, or in shows uh, on ABC, is conjectural. And sometimes they will be right, and sometimes they will be wrong. And the key thing is to be right more than you're wrong. No one's 100% right. All right. If no, no, oh, sorry, there's so many questions. Well, number four, thank you. I have a question on the uh, end of stagnation. Uh, adjusted monetary base for the US dollar stands at four times what it was in September 2008. If you are correct, is it necessary for the US Federal Reserve to start unwinding its balance sheet soon, and will that be difficult? Uh, no, and uh, therefore it doesn't matter. The, uh, the evidence on balance sheet expansion through the ages and for those of you who are not obsessed with monetary policy, forgive us. But the evidence is very clear that central banks, for example, in World War II, greatly expanded their balance sheets. They didn't really ever contract them nominally. Over time, economies grew, and in relative terms, the balance sheets contracted. I don't think there is going to be any sustained effort to reduce those balance sheets in nominal terms, and I think it would be futile to try to do so. All right. Number three. Uh, Neil, um you mentioned China and Russia. Uh, there are countries with long-term, strong, stable leaders, whatever we might think about their system of government and philosophy. In this country, we've had five prime ministers in five years. What do we need to change? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. The one thing that I learned from writing, another of the things that I learned from writing the Kissinger book was that a Harvard professor in a foreign country should be extremely cautious about <laughs> offering opinions about local uh, politics. Every single person in this auditorium knows more about Australian politics than I do. And so I'm not going to make the mistake that Kissinger made when he was on a lecture tour, I think, in Pakistan and was asked a question along these lines about Pakistan. And as he describes it uh, at the time, you know, I felt as a Harvard professor I was omniscient. And if somebody was asking me a question, it must be because I knew the answer. Uh, I, I, I really don't know the answer to that, and I, nor am I going to attempt to confect or con construct an answer off the cuff. It would be incredibly pretentious and arrogant of me to do that. Do we have a question from number one? Yes, yes ma'am. Hi, um, you spoke earlier of, I guess, the demise of intellectualism and that there needed to be some sort of a backlash. What do you envisage as being that backlash? Well, I think the, the backlash is happening in the sense that populism hates uh, academic elites. 
I mean, if I say that I'm a Harvard professor to the average truck driver, the contempt that will cross his face <laughs> is really blood-curdling. So I think that the, the disconnect is, is not just a disconnect in terms of income inequality. There's a kind of disconnect in terms of intellectual traffic. The, the, the people who are outside College America regard College America with disdain, and it's reciprocated by people like my colleagues who would never give the time of day to a truck driver. I think it's deeply unhealthy. I, I grew up in Glasgow, as you may still just about be able to detect in my accent, and one of the benefits of growing up in Glasgow was that I was taught by my parents and my grandparents to treat everybody equally and to regard the bus driver as, as much worthy of a conversation as the Duke of Montrose. And that was a fantastic preparation for life. It, it has meant that I've never ever hesitated to engage in conversation with the proverbial Joe Sixpack, and often those conversations are a lot more fun than the conversations I have with my more politically correct colleagues. I think one of the things that makes me feel at home in, in this town in this country is that there's a somewhat similar spirit here and I, traveling as I have done in the last couple of days, back and forth in planes, I, I noticed immediately that there isn't the same sense of, of intellectual disconnection that seems to mar American public life today and explains, I think, why, you know, why Trump has resonated in the way that he has. I think none of this would really be possible if it hadn't been for the trahison de clerc, this fundamental betrayal by the intellectuals of the very working class that they always seem to claim to be acting on behalf of, but never actually mix with. And one from number two. Okay. Hi there. Australia is at an interesting crossroads. We come to the end of, the, of an economic boom. I think um, heading to an election, the leaders are possibly looking for new ideas so that the economic system of Australia can be improved. Was there a country in the past in a similar situation? And is there anything we can learn from them? This is a great question, and it's a, an opportunity to do applied history. I think that the, the, the prosperity that Australia has enjoyed has in fact been uh, enjoyed in somewhat similar forms by a whole bunch of countries that found themselves uh, on the right side of a resources boom driven mainly by Chinese demand. And compared with some of the other players in this space, you have done much better. Uh, think Brazil, think Russia. Uh, so in fact, Australia's boom, when I take a step back and try to understand it, uh, was not too narrowly confined to the resources sector, that others did not uh, benefit from it. And Australia's economic policies, which I think were, were on a very secure foundation to begin with, going back to the time of, of John Howard. This country was put through a fiscal cleanup that many another country wishes it had done. And that has given it a great deal of, of breathing space and perhaps it might be said space to make mistakes. So the lessons are fairly obvious and I don't think they're any different from the lessons that some of us were uh, offering at the time of the boom. Uh, this is the chance, that was the chance to get the house in order for the long run and not to create the kind of fiscal imbalances I was talking about earlier. Uh, any country that has large resource wealth has to be very careful in managing it with the interests of posterity in mind because extractive industries by their very nature uh, have a finite life. And that matters a lot if you're thinking in terms of the long run, Australia's next 100, 200 years. Paul Collier, my old friend at Oxford, has written very eloquently about this, about mainly African countries. But the points he makes in books like The Plundered Planet actually apply equally well to develop countries with large resource sectors. And let me make a, a general point. Notice I'm sneaking away from talking too specifically about Australia, just out of my own ignorance. We should hold developed countries to the same standards that for years we've been trying to hold less developed countries to. In the World Bank, in the realm of development economics, 
over the last generation or so, there has been an argument that there must be greater uh, transparency, that there needs to be budgeting for the long term, that there needs to be rule of law, and so forth and, and so on, that there needs to be explicit constitutional underpinnings for the management of resources, that there need to be really large sovereign wealth funds built so that the benefits of extraction now are not consumed solely by the generation living now. All of those arguments have been made uh, about mainly developing countries. They should equally apply to wealthy countries. In the great degeneration, I made the point that it's one thing to improve the institutions of a poor country, and we're all in favor of that. But it's another thing to allow the institutions of a rich country to deteriorate. And that insidious process where institutions get worse imperceptibly because people are complacent, that has gone much further in the United States than here. But it could happen here. And sometimes I think what Australians need to do is a little bit more comparative political economy Ask yourselves the question, could our future end up looking like America's present? Could the middle class be hollowed out? Could the generational imbalances become completely unsustainable? Could the media and the intellectuals be so estranged from the rugby league fans that ultimately Trump emerges in some Australian incarnation? And those are the sorts of lessons that Australia should be learning while it still has time. I'm sure we're quite capable of it, thank you. Now, it, it pains me to say this, and I'm terribly sorry for those who've been asking, uh, who are in the line to ask questions, but I'm afraid our time is up, and uh, I would love to lock the doors right now and just keep you here for another 24 hours, because everybody uh, hangs off what you say. And Neil, thank you so much. It's been the most um, wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you, Tiggy. Thank you all very much indeed.